We are going to have a look at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, first few verses, that is from 1 to 13. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, 1 to 13. When he came down from mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. But only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel I found such great faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. This is a familiar passage, but I pray to God that the familiarity should not be a burden for us because God can speak to us at different times uh, in a different way from the same words. I have entitled this message as Jesus Christ, the coming King who will end sickness and death. You see, uh, recently, actually a couple of months ago, my niece fell sick. She went through a terrible condition in the hospital nearly a month. Later she came out of the sickness by God's grace and she's all right now. Through the entire period of her sickness, while I was there in the hospital, I used to hear a dreadful news of someone dying or something being rushed, someone being rushed to the ICU. I saw all sorts of things there in the hospital, what hospital looked like, you know how a casualty will look like. I could see more closely the reality of sickness and death. Often people say death is not a subject that one could talk about. People generally don't talk about it. But the fact is, sickness and death are a terrible, are terribly real. I'm sure even you need no persuasion to believe that sickness and death are a terribly real. Because you have been through that in the recent past. And it's more truer now. It's there all around us. It's there in the newspaper in the morning. When you pick up the newspaper, it's all over there. When you turn on the television, it's there. And when you pick up the mobile, it is there. So what I want to ask you this morning is, how do you react to that terrible, uh, this terrible reality? I think one very common reaction is despair and rejection. You just feel despair. Nothing can come to any good. And along with that reaction of despair, I think another very common reaction is to ask why? Why cancer? Why infection? Why this virus? Why this heart attack? Why now? Why me? In our passage this morning, we see sickness and death. We meet a man who is suffering from leprosy and we also meet a man, a servant who was about to die. And we meet Jesus Christ and we find in him answers answers as to why, answers as to despair. Let's start with the question of why. Why the world is in such a mess today? In my conversation with various people and in their answers to that question, why the world is in such a mess, I could hear more of a, more of a complaining sort of things. You talk to anybody, they say it's because of the environment, complaints against environment, man's problem of corruption, wickedness, they say not uh, taking enough responsibility and they, they talk more about politicians, manip politicians manipulating the system and things like that. In other words, all the answers which I heard were what you could call the horizontal 
as to how we treat each other. The Bible actually has a more profound explanation for the mess in our world. Of course, it has to do with how we treat each other. But underneath it, it has to do with our attitude to God. It's the humanity as a whole and their vertical relationship with God. The Bible sees the mess in the world and in particular sickness and death as a sign that things are not right between us and God. It's the evidence of a judged world. This is our first point. Let's try, uh, let me explain to you this more deeper. You see, if you, if you step back to a little, uh, in the beginning of uh, the Bible, which is Genesis, you see, back in uh, Genesis, God made a perfect world. He gave everything to man with no sickness and death. Only condition for man was to remain under his care and governance and he was prohibited from exercising his own volition as far as the matter of evil, sin and death is concerned. If he chose to be within God's grave, he would live life lacking nothing void of sickness and death. On the other hand, if he chose to be independent of him, he would be experiencing death and misery in separation from him. Adam and Eve, and in them all the humanity, plunged into sickness and death by saying to God, I want to be in charge of my life. I'll run the world my way and we all have rejected him. And that rebellion ever brought disaster on our world and caused all the mess. You could imagine, it's like the golden fish in a bowl. You see, swimming, it swims all around the bowl. It gets bored. It tries to jump out and see the outer environment and soon it discovers it can't. It starts dying in the new world it wanted to explore because it was made for water. That's the kind of fundamental principle in life. And the point is we are made to live under God's rule. You change it, it's a disaster. As we have rejected God, disasters happened in our world including sickness and death. So back in Genesis, God says, For dust you are, and to dust thou shalt return. In other words, you have rejected me, void of my life, you will die now. Sickness and death are part of God's judgment, part of God's just and the right response for us for rejecting him. So all along, we have seen sickness and death in this passage, where a man with leprosy and a servant who was about to die, we also see sickness and death in our lives and we see sickness and death all around us in the world we live. We say why and the Bible answer is because we rejected God and there is no and there is a sign, a taste of judgment. But I don't think that we often think like this. I realize this first point which I just am speaking about, the taste of God's judgment particularly is not very welcome, it's not joyful and welcome. And you might be thinking, fine, we have to God to do with the death and sickness and we understood that, but what about God's grace? What about uh, healing? What about restoration? What's God's mercy? Well, you see, in our passage, in Matthew 8, look at the verse 3. Jesus raised his hand and touched the man and he said, I am willing. Be clean and immediately he was cured of his leprosy. See 13 also. And the centurion and uh, the and to the centurion Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Sickness and death, just gone, overcome, changed, healed. There, there is clearly hope here. There is clearly answer here. There is restoration here. Jesus has done it. But here lies the important thing that you have to understand. We need to understand this sort of answer that Jesus is offering here does not mean that Jesus will heal all the sicknesses and stop all deaths today. Even those who got well and got healed died eventually. So I want to suggest the main thing that Jesus is doing here is he's giving us a picture of a perfect world. 
this is our second point. The point is God's picture of a perfect world, which Jesus is presenting us today in this particular text. Now you see, Jesus having healed the leper and the servant, he says something like this in verse 11. He says, many will come from east and west and will take place, will take their places in the feast of the Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. You see, Jesus is connecting the healing to something which is future. Here Jesus is talking about a future perfect world. It's actually a world that God promised in the Old Testament. You see, God made many promises in the Old Testament saying, one day I will put this world in right condition. It's, you, it's worth looking back actually uh, into the Bible for these promises. Some of it we'll see. Please turn with me to the book of Isaiah 25. Verse 6 to 8. Isaiah 25, 6 to 8. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all the people a feast of rich food and a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the peoples and veil that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all the faces and the reproach of all his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. This is like a taste of what God has in store. Foods, wine, celebration of people. You see, in verse, particularly in verse 7, Isaiah 25, he says like this, On this mountain, he will destroy the tribe that unfolds all the people. He will swallow up death forever. But again, if you see, one day sickness will come and death will strike. That is the reality in this world. Both the centurion servant as well as the leper have died after receiving complete healing from the Lord. But in this new world, nothing will spoil God's policy. Nothing will bring or uh, nothing will take away God's life. Nothing will bring any tears. Basically, it's a promise of what we call heaven, God's perfect world. It's, it's, it's a fantastic promise, unbelievable. But that's, that's, that's the problem. In fact, it seems rather unbelievable, isn't it, for us? Now, when that is happening, a man called Jesus walks into the world and meets somebody who is sick. And he says in verse 3, I'm willing, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he says in verse 13, go and it will be done. And the servant is healed at that very hour. See, we've got a promise of a perfect world where sickness and death are just taken away. And then Jesus comes and he gives us a demonstration of it. He gives us a proof of it. He gives us a picture of the future kingdom. The healing is amazing. You see, there is no examination. There is, there, there is no prescription. There is no surgery. There is no drugs. There are no drugs. There are, there are no complications. There is no rehabilitation, there is no physio, there is no outpatient department. It's amazing. A word, a touch, and the sickness has vanished. It just goes. Now what Jesus is doing here is giving us a picture of the future. You see, it's like this. I, I remember once I went uh, on a company conference tour. We were taken to an uh, ocean to see the coral reef. We never had any idea at that time. I'm talking about 10 years back. Before the trip, we were taken to a small auditorium and were shown a movie on Coral Reef for 20 minutes. The picture of the Coral Reef was amazing. Everybody got astonished. Almost the experience was real, like as if you are under the sea. Many of us in the tour then opted to go for the Coral Reef trip before they were, they were having a plan of going for shopping. They made you believe, I mean the company made you believe that the trip was worth. But if we had not believed it, 
because we did not have the foretaste of it, we wouldn't have gone for the trip. This is the whole point of the promotion video. This is what Jesus is doing here. He comes into our world and says, I am God's king, the rescuer. I am going to bring about God's kingdom. I am going to bring about God's perfect world, the world of Isaiah 25. I am going to put an end to all the misery, put this world in a right order. And we think to ourselves, really, a, a, a lot to believe, such as the dream world. And Jesus says, let me give you a picture of it. Let me give, uh, give you a demonstration of it. And let me give you a trailer as to how the future will unfold. And he heals the leper by just touching him and he heals the centurion by send, just sending the word. This is nothing but the foretaste that God, even today, he gives to many people as to the uh, full reality of the future kingdom. You see, it's like the trailer of the future date when Jesus will return and once again he will speak and sickness and death will evaporate and get vanished and God's perfect world will start. We said sickness and death often leads to despair but in the face of death you feel nothing can come to any close, uh, any good. That when it comes to death nothing is going to do any good but Jesus is saying here, look at the future, look at the picture of the future, death is in the last word. In my kingdom, there is no death, there is no sorrow, there is no sickness. It's everything is in order. So there is an answer to sickness and death. There is a king called Jesus who will bring about God's perfect kingdom. Now the question is, if this is what Jesus is going to do, how can we be part of that kingdom? How can we be part of God's perfect world? Our future lies in God's flawless world. But we have to start somewhere. Let's start with an entry to God's flawless world. That's the third part of it. You know, you see in the how to enter God's perfect world. That's our third part. See in verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he, he was astonished and said to the following. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you. With no one in Israel I have found such great faith. I say to you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying, this man is going to be included in God's party. He is going to sit down at the feast. And why? Because he has faith. He is talking about centurion. The thing is, many times we get confused as to what is faith. Faith sometimes sounds rather weird for us, vague. What does it mean to have faith? Let's look at this man again to see what is the faith. Because Jesus said, this guy is going to be in the kingdom of God. All that he said is, Lord, come and heal my servant. I'm not worthy to come and have you under my roof. But Jesus is now saying, many will come from east and west and will take part in the kingdom of God, which means that he is including this guy, the centurion, into God's kingdom, the perfect God's world which we are speaking about. You see, what is this guy doing that we normally find it difficult? What does it mean to have faith? I think we discover two things from this centurion. First of all, faith means you don't trust yourself. Verse 7, you see, Jesus says, I'm, Jesus said to the centurion, I'll go and heal the servant. But the centurion said, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. You see, this man, the centurion, has seen something in Jesus' life. His love, his humility, his generosity, his integrity. That has made him to realize that he can't have Jesus come under his house. Or he must have imagined that that he is not worthy, he is thinking of himself, he says to himself, I know what I am like, I know I have what I have done, I know what I have said, and I know the mistakes that I have made. Being a Roman officer, I have mistreated and unjustly treated many people, innocent people, and butchered them through the soldiers, and I am not worthy to have Jesus to come under my place. You see, the humility of this man. So Jesus is marveled when he said that. 
Now I want you to slow down and think. This man is th thinking, that is the centurion is thinking, that he is not worthy to have Jesus come under his roof to heal the servant. And therefore he says, just send the word and my servant will be healed. If he is not worthy to have Jesus under his roof, how much less is he not worthy to have a place in Jesus' perfect world? See, that's the first part of the faith. Not trusting yourself. I don't deserve this, he says. And Jesus says, you are the right candidate for it, for the faith. And the second part of the faith is putting the trust in Jesus. See what he says. He says, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. And he says like this, so I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one to go and he goes and the other one to come and he comes. And I tell my servant to do this and he does it. And he says, so it is with you, Jesus. You see, you have to understand something. In the Roman army, they had a system of delegated authority where, where the centurion says, I am a man under authority. That is under the authority of the emperor. And when he spoke, it is like the emperor speaking. So he says to the soldiers, and the soldiers do listen as if they are listening to the emperor. And he sees Jesus speaks God's, with God's authority in the same fashion. So he is likening his role model, uh, his model as like Jesus' authority under God. He sees Jesus as God's king who is in charge of making things happen. And so he enters himself to him and that is faith. To say, first of all, I can't do it. And then to say, Jesus, you can do it. So Jesus says, this man will be in God's feast. This man is going to be in God's perfect world. That's he says, you got the name tag there. You are going to be included in the God's kingdom. There is a place set out for you because you have faith. And if we have faith today, Jesus says the same thing to us. We might think, I am not worthy. I don't deserve. And then you look at Jesus and say, but you can get me there. You can do it. You can get me a place in the God's perfect kingdom. You are God's king and I trust you. And then Jesus says to us, come on board, come to the kingdom. I've got a place for you and to put your name on God's perfect world. You see, I'm afraid I have to mention this also, the alternative to this, and that is exclusion from God's perfect world. Because Jesus says in verse 11, many will come from east and west and take their places. But in verse 12, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness, in that place they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Sickness and death, we said, are reality and they show us the taste of God's judgment. But they speak of a much worse reality, God's full judgment of exclusion. Jesus says, the sons of the kingdom will go there. He is talking about the religious Jews of his day who thought they deserve the place in the kingdom because they belong to Abraham. They belong to the Israel where the God promises were made. They assumed they were on the guest list that they were sure to go in. And they thought they didn't need Jesus Christ to get them in. But Jesus is saying they will be thrown out. See, and if we copy them and say, of course I've I've got a place there. I'm, I'm, I'm God's uh, child and I don't need Jesus. We too will be excluded. Jesus is offering us a place in a perfect world. The alternative to this is exclusion and despair. And as we look at Jesus today, let's react with faith and with trust. Maybe it's for the first time that we put trust in Jesus Christ or it might be for the thousandth time but we keep trusting him to take us to heaven. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to your presence, Lord, we remember your words that you spoke to us about our world. The world is in anarchy, Lord, in a perfect disorder. But Lord, your Son has promised us a kingdom. He is going to come and restore everything for us, Lord. 
He is creating a perfect world there. He said in John, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come back and take you to be there with me. Where I am, he may be also. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful promise he has given us, Lord. But help us, Lord, to trust him, to be humble like the centurion, to know that we don't deserve it. At the same time, our Savior can afford it for us, Lord. Thank you for all that you have done in our lives in order to save us into your perfect world. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.